We are so pleased to have Dr. Moore Dwyer with us this afternoon. Um, Dr. Dwyer is going to focus on the importance of program implementation using Maryland's Health Enterprise Zones as an example. So Dr. Dwyer is the Director of the Office of Data Systems Integration and New Initiatives at the Maryland Department of Health. And she currently serves as the Program Director for the Maryland Health Enterprise Zone Initiative. Dr. Dwyer earned her Doctorate of Public Health in Environmental Health Sciences here at Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, a Master's in Public Health at George Washington University, and a Bachelor's of Science at Villanova University. Dr. Dwyer has worked in various capacities, including education, research, evaluation, program design and implementation, and policy development. Her work has focused primarily on eliminating disparities in environmental exposures, chronic disease, HIV and AIDS, and birth outcomes. Dr. Dwyer is a lecturer in the Prevention and Community Health Department at George Washington University. We are live streaming this afternoon. Um, we will also hold questions until the very end. Dr. Dwyer will present for about 40 to 45 minutes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dwyer. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here, be back at Hopkins, and to um, share uh, some of our experiences with the Maryland Health Enterprise Zones Initiative. And of course, I want to um, start off by acknowledging Dr. Sharfstein and Michelle Spencer, who were our fearless leaders on this initiative, both in the design phase and in the implementation phase. So it, we, it really wouldn't have happened without them. So, um, OK. So I was thinking about different implementation frameworks, and I'll just fess up right up front. With the HEZs, we didn't, from the beginning, have an implementation framework. But of course, we had several essential elements of an implementation framework. And I started out thinking about the precede proceed model, which I really like because of the heavy emphasis on um, assessing needs and really looking at underlying factors before designing and launching, implementing, managing, and evaluating uh, um, an initiative. But then I was doing some um, research and I found that Dr. Frieden, the former director of the CDC in 2014, had proposed these six um, essential um, components or elements of effective public health program implementation. And they're really particularly relevant to the health enterprise zone. So I thought I'd share them here today and kind of use this as the framework with which to present the HEZ experiment, experience. So um, in his model, you'll see innovation is really um, at the center. It's the driver, and it supports all of the other elements um, of this model. So you know, in, in terms of innovation, um, developing and informing the evidence base for um, action. And there really were several very innovative elements of the health enterprise zones, which I'll talk about in more detail. But um, they were leveraged to design, um, I mean, to design to leverage new incentives in the system due to um, health care reform efforts at the state and federal level. Um, and they were designed to bring the principles of economic development to public health. And they provided support for community health worker interventions within the healthcare system at a time where that support was still um, spotty. Um, and it provided broad support for health IT um, development and solutions at the local level. So those were some, and I'll talk more about some of these other innovative pieces. But, and it was also, it's, it's essentially at its heart, it's a place-based initiative like the Harlem Children's Zone and um, the place, the promised neighborhoods, the baby, um, healthy baby, the best baby zones. So, and those of course are designed to facilitate investments in local communities. And that is what the HEZs uh, did, which I'll, sh again, you'll learn more about. So, and then if having a select group of related and effective and scalable um, interventions that together will sustain synergistic improvements in a, um, in a community, and this is what we had, and you, you'll see um, when I present in more detail, we had, but and it needed more refining um, for sure, our package of um, scalable and effective interventions. Um, accurate and timely information um, is absolutely critical for performance management. 
that takes time, especially when you're working with um, communities to build that capacity. So that um, is something that we arrived at um, over the course of the initiative. Um, Public health, you know, is increasingly complex, and a lot of the health issues in these communities are very complex. So it really does require coalition-based approaches and extensive and radical partnerships across sectors. And so that was something else that I think the, the HEZs actually did very well. And of course, these partners can supplement resources and activities and take on some of the efforts, like advocacy efforts, that maybe some other partners, like the government, um, is not able to do. Um, communication for stakeholder engagement, patient engagement and behavior change, you know, communicating successes, benefits, threats that you're addressing, um, the human face, the business case, these are all essential, in particular for sustainability, um, which I'll talk about. And then, of course, political commitment, um, which is really necessary for the resources and support needed um, to implement. So, um, so anyway, if, if, in case some of you are not or are new to Maryland, I thought I'd start out with a brief introduction um, to the state of Maryland. We have a population of 5.8 million and 24 counties or jurisdictions, which includes Baltimore City. Maryland is the seventh most diverse state in uh, the country, with racial and ethnic minorities accounting for 45% of the state's population. And Maryland, of course, has outstanding medical schools and schools of public health and hospitals and one of the highest median incomes nationwide and the second highest number of primary care physicians per 100,000 population. But of course, we experience significant disparities and um, chronic disease burden, and uh, which is what the HEZs were designed to um, address. So, um, you know, and chronic disease, though very preventable, um, is among the most common and costly health problems in the country. And in Maryland, it disproportionately impacts those of low socioeconomic status, those without a high school education, and um, communities of color. And here you'll see some of our disparities in asthma ED visit rates. Um, every county where rates have been reported, um, there are significant disparities in asthma ED visits by race. Um, and of course, disparities being the preventable differences in how different populations um, are affected by disease, injury, violence, um, and certain uh, and, uh, risk factors. So, and here's, this was actually um, when Dr. Sharfstein was the health commissioner at the Baltimore City Health Department, they um, developed community statistical areas and um, then outlined a number of health outcomes and risk factors and socioeconomic indicators within each of these community statistical areas. And these were more representative of actual neighborhoods and communities than um, census box or zip codes. So here you'll see the tremendous diversity between two communities in Baltimore City. In Rowan Park, you have a, a median income of over $90,000, an unemployment rate of 3.4% life expectancy of over 83 years, and a homicide rate of 4.1 per 10,000. Um, and in the Madison East End neighborhood, you have an income of just over $30,000, an unemployment rate of over 14%, um, life expectancy of just under 65 years, and a homicide rate of 46.3 per 10,000 residents. So, and of course, um, disparities, you know, are, they're a matter of, inefficiencies and a matter of injustice. And so this was an um, analysis done with our, the folks in our Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities and the, the folks here in the Center for Health Disparities Solutions, um, where they looked at um, the cost of disparities um, in Maryland and across the country, actually. And so there were one, between one and two billion dollars per year of direct medical costs due to disparities. And excess charges from black, white hospitalization disparities alone were 814 million, and that was in 2011. So, and it's folks, of course, the inefficiencies are a result, um, are created by folks not being able for a variety of reasons to access care at the right time in the right setting so they end up in more expensive settings like the ED as opposed to a primary care office and with uh, more severe disease or um, complications. 
So we realized that there was a need for focused attention because, of course, the areas with the worst health outcomes in Maryland were the most costly. And so in 2012, the Maryland General Assembly passed the Maryland Health Improvement and Disparities Reduction Act. And um, it established the health enterprise zones and provided $4 million per year for four years to support the development of the health enterprise zones. Um, the legislatively mandated outcomes were to reduce health disparities, improve health outcomes, and reduce health costs and hospital emissions and readmissions in specific areas of the state, which I'll introduce you to in just a moment. And these, the legislatively mandated outcomes were selected because they were data that we had timely access to, um, and they were, we knew they were quality data sets. They reflect significant disparities in the state and these were metrics that could be moved in that four-year time period because we knew that the Maryland General Assembly would be very interested in seeing um, movement in those metrics. And luckily, we, we are seeing some movement, which I'll, be, I'll present shortly. So what is a health enterprise zone? It's a designated local community with documented poverty, health disparities, and poor health outcomes um, with where special incentives and funding streams were available to address poor health outcomes by using healthcare level, community level, and individual level interventions. These communities essentially, through um, coalitions, designed kind of local healthcare systems to meet the needs, um, both medical and social needs, of the folks in their communities. So we have had five HEZs. Um, three based at hospitals, two based at local health departments, two in suburban areas, two in rural areas, and one um, in an urban area. So uh, one was based at the Anne Arundel Medical Center in Annapolis. One was based at the Prince George's health, County Health Department. One was based at Bon Secours Hospital in West Baltimore. Um, one was based at the Caroline and Dorchester County Health Departments on the Eastern Shore, and then one was based in Southern Maryland at the MedStar St. Mary's Hospital. So in the HEZ eligibility criteria, um, so we mapped every zip code in the state by these eligibility criteria so that communities would know if they met the criteria and then could define themselves as a community and apply to become a health enterprise zone. So they had to be um, a, a community or contiguous cluster of communities designed by zip code boundaries, one or multiple zip codes. It had to have a resident population of at least 5,000 individuals. Um, it had to have greater economic disadvantage than the Maryland average, and that was measured through Medicaid enrollment rates or WIC participation rates, and it had to have poorer health outcomes than the Maryland average, and that was measured through lower life expectancy or percentage of low birth weight infants. So we had 19 communities apply, and five were awarded. Um, you'll see the um, HEZ is in at the Anne Arundel County, uh, Anne Arundel Medical Center in Annapolis is number one on the map. And that served one zip code in um, Annapolis. And it was actually, Anne Arundel Medical Center had identified one subsidized senior housing facility where there were a very large number of 911 calls and ED visits each year. And so they placed a clinic, a primary care medical home, in the ground floor of that housing facility. But it, so it served the residents of that facility as well as residents of the surrounding community. Um, number two is um, seven zip codes on the Eastern Shore in Caroline and Dorchester counties, um, based at the Caroline and Dorchester Health Departments. Zone number three is the Prince George's County HEZ, based at the Prince George's County Health Department, and that serves one zip code in the Capitol Heights area of Prince George's County. Um, number four is four zip codes in the greater Lexington Park area of St. Mary's County. Um, and based at MedStar St. Mary's Hospital. And then number five is our West Baltimore zone that serves five zip codes on um, the west side of Baltimore and based again at um, Bon Secours Hospital. So 
We um, have one of the earliest offices of minority health and health disparities in, in state health departments. And so they've been doing um, a lot of great work over a number of years, and they were very instrumental. Their work uh, in, in contributed to the, the um, political commitment, will, and support in the State Assembly to develop this initiative. So they had developed six key strategies to address health disparities that are generally applicable to public health programs. So this kind of served as the beginnings of our technical package of interventions, which again, I, and I'll talk more about it, it was refined and further developed over time. But um, they became HEZ guiding principles and they were incorporated into the review criteria for um, the applicant, the applying community, applicant communities. Cultural, linguistic, and health literacy competency. So each of the strategic plans focused on um, these areas. Workforce, diversity, and development, outreach to and targeting of minority populations, racial, ethnic, and language data collection and reporting, addressing social determinants of health, and a balance between provider-focused interventions and community-focused interventions. So, and the social determinants of health that were addressed through the five HEZs um, included transportation, food de deserts, educational attainment, workforce development, healthcare access, safe places for physical activity, and language and cultural barriers. So the HEZs each had to be a coalition with a lead or you know coordinating organization that managed the program. Um, again, there were a, a, a wide diversity of partnerships. Um, applications had to target investments to the community and um, involve the target community in the development and implementation and evaluation of their programs. And metrics had to measure um, change in specific outcomes most importantly, the legislatively mandated outcomes. Um, the initiative was managed at the State Health Department um, with support from the Community Health Resources Commission, and jointly these two entities provided technical support, and you'll see here there were a number of offices and administrations and bureaus involved in providing technical support to the five um, HEZs. This um, is our HEZ logic model. I'm sure you've had lots of exposure to logic models. Um, essentially, um, the, the HEZs were looking to improve capacity at the local level, um, and that was using through using tax credits, hiring um, tax credits and um, income tax credits to recruit primary care, dental, and behavioral health providers to these underserved communities. And so the first year was really focused on increasing that capacity. So recruiting providers, opening and or expanding new healthcare delivery sites, everything from mobile units to um, new primary care medical homes, new federally qualified health centers, new behavioral health sites. Um, the second year was largely focused on um, increasing the, um, well, recruiting participants to the newly added capacity, so filling the capacity, which you'd think you build, you open these new clinics and you build, you develop these great programs and you just expect people are going to come running. If you build it, they will come. That's not quite how it works, especially in communities where folks are so stretched thin, have so many com competing demands and limited resources and just other priorities. So um, that was a lesson learned, which I'll talk more about. And again, back to the, the implementation framework requires um, communication, strategic communication, social marketing. Because um, you really are, especially in these communities where folks didn't have primary care providers, they were used to using emergency departments. So that's a significant behavior change and requires more rigorous social marketing efforts than we had planned for. Um, and then years three and four were focused on um, improving the quality of the new capacity and um, increasing patient self-management ability. And, um, and then improving outcomes. So one thing, um, so here's just a bit um, 
uh, one thing that's really important to understand is, is the changes in the healthcare system um, throughout the course of the HEZs, which I'll talk about in just a minute, and it impacted um, significantly our implementation and the implementation timeline. But um, so again, the HEZ, it provided state income tax credits, hiring tax credits, grants for program support, equipment purchase or lease, and loan repayment assistance programs, again, to bring in providers, the wraparound public health and social services, um, and open new health care delivery sites. So, and practitioners who received the tax credits or loan repayment um, incentives had to complete cultural competency training, they had to accept Medicaid and uninsured patients, and they had to receive a letter of support from the lead HEZ um, agency in each of the HEZ, with it, whatever HEZ they were participating with. So, the HEZs um, were, they received their funding in 2013, April of 2013. And so the strategic plans they had developed were largely um, kind of, um, if and the older public health, based on the older public health approach or model. Um, and in 2014, of course, we had the Affordable Care Act increase access um, to health care insurance for a significant um, size of our population in, Mar in Maryland. We expanded Medicaid, and in um, 2014, all Maryland hospitals went to global budgets, which means that they are paid a, a fixed amount each year um, to serve a statistically designated population. And so if patients keep coming back because they're poorly managed, um, they will be eating into the bottom line, essentially, of the hospital. So it shifts the focus from volume to value. So, and again, this was a huge shift in um, the healthcare system and um, in public health, starting um, with the Affordable Care Act and a lot of payment reform efforts um, at the state and federal level. But Maryland was the first state to move to global budgets. And so, the HEZs were designed, you know, in these communities where there were such large populations of uninsured folks, it was very hard for providers to be able to sustain a medical practice. So we knew if we provided those incentives to help stand, and grant dollars to help stand up a new practice, then they would have a more insured patient population due to the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion in Maryland to help sustain those practices. So that was um, one key piece. Um, but we also know that these folks would be a lot of um, very complex patients with long ignored health issues because they didn't have health insurance. So they would need the intense um, public health and wraparound support services. So that's another key part of this, the design of this program. Um, so, and then of course, it positioned these communities. So the hospitals now, once they are on global budgets, they're incentivized to really look upstream, to focus on preventions, to think, oh my gosh, how do we keep these people from ever coming back to our hospital? Because it's gonna eat into our bottom line. So they were very quick, or some, of course, there's a steep learning curve for hospitals. So some are, are further along the curve than others. but. Um, to start looking to partner with community-based programs and with public health um, to keep their designated commun communities healthier and out of their beds. So these, again, these um, communities were well posi positioned then to be partners to the hospitals to help focus on prevention and keep these communities health healthy and out of the hospitals. So. Um, so anyway, you'll see now our five um, HEZs and um, some of the key um, strategies that they employed over the four years. So this is the Annapolis Morris Blum Housing um, HEZ, where they put a primary care clinic, a new primary care medical home, um, in the, the ground floor of the Morris Blum Senior Housing Facility. And it's home to 184 residents, but it provided capacity for those residents and um, non-resident patients from the surrounding community as well. And it took those significant time, and you can imagine, to develop uh, trust with these residents 
and relationships with these residents and to reduce barriers um, like only being paneled with certain residents in the building and so then a resident starts feeling sick and they come down to the clinic and the clinic says oh sorry we don't take your insurance We're, we can't see you so that of course caused just eroded trust the opposite direction so anyway there were a lot of lessons learned so they switched to a completely open door policy extended their hours never turned anyone away really worked to um, engage and involve um, the residents in running the clinic many of the residents ended up serving as volunteers to help um, staff the, provide education to residents and community and, and organize walking groups and community education events um, so and they had um, all of the HEZs started out with more traditional community health worker programs and that you know they'd go do outreach and education at health fairs and at, in various community settings and encounter folks who might need services and provide referrals and some education but we realized that if we were going to get to those land legislatively mandated outcomes um, of reduced um, admissions readmissions and um, ED visits and we were going to help the hospitals meet their global budgets that we really had to be much more targeted so data systems were developed across all five HEZs that help identify high, high utilizers of hospital care so folks that had recently been admitted or had multiple readmissions or had a recent ED visit and high utilizer was defined differently in each of the zones because utilization varies significantly for a number of factors um, by geographic area but um, so folks um, who were high utilizers were identified and recruited um, through data and recruited into the, the intense wraparound public health and social service um, interventions like care coordination services um, there were also a, a number of community enabling interventions that would support folks in self-management efforts such as walking groups, blood pressure screening, specialty behavioral health access, um, smoking cessation workshops, nutrition classes, medication re reconciliation classes through partnership with pharma um, pharmacy students. So, and their target outcomes were improved chronic disease management and patient health outcomes, decreased 911 calls, ED visits, admissions and readmissions specifically from that building the Morris Plum residents and from the surrounding community and they focused largely on diabetes and smoking prevention um, the Dorchester Caroline counties the, all, all of the zones except West Baltimore focused on target communities of roughly just over 30,000 individuals um, West Baltimore's was about 130,000 individuals so they created a new mobile um, mental health crisis team that served Dorchester and Caroline counties that could respond to folks who were having a mental health issue um, to divert them from emergency rooms they, well they might need to end up in emergency room but also from incarceration they expanded um, a women's health practice with three full-time primary care practitioners they expanded a school-based wellness center um, they also initiated a care a very targeted care community care coordination program between um, a federally qualified health center on the eastern shore chop tank and um, the community health workers on the eastern shore which are based at associated black charities um, they expanded access to peer recovery support specialists which of course are now being uh, much more widely employed than ever before given the opioid epidemic um, a school-based asthma management program a weight management program and they opened an adult mental health clinic in the Federalsburg area of the Eastern Shore and they were aiming to decrease hospital and ED utilization rates and focus on behavioral health diabetes hypertension and obesity the greater Lexington Park HEZ also implemented a care coordination community health worker program it was hospital based started out focusing very much on folks who had been inpatient um, but then moved to focusing on folks who as well were in the emergency department um, creating they created a new community health center which is just opening in Lexington um, Park they opened a private practice um, affiliated with the hospital um, they developed a health care transportation route because transportation is such an issue in this rural area um, it has it's a 16-stop route that's 
stops any place healthy, whether it's a library or a park or a physician practice or a community health clinic um, or a grocery store. Um, but then, of course, the, the demand for transportation was so overwhelming, and a lot of folks needed to get outside the zone to go to dialysis appointments or other specialty care appointments, so they also developed a specialty transportation service. Um, they've provided access to a mobile dental health clinic. They expanded a mobile primary care clinic, and they integrated behavioral health and somatic health services. For example, on that mobile health um, primary care clinic, they integrated psychiatric services. So when they were looking to reduce preventable hospital emergency ED visits, admissions, and readmissions for chronic disease, and they focused on diabetes, cardiovascular disease, asthma, and behavioral health. The Prince George's County Zone established five new patient-centered medical homes, which as a local health department is no small feat, because of course we didn't give them enough money to actually open, the, they had to leverage dollars and go through county boards and you know county council, and it was really amazing to think that they were able to open five new patient-centered medical homes. They developed a county level, level health information exchange that connects to each of those new prim, um, primary care medical homes and to our state level health information exchange and a number of other um, providers, labs, et cetera, in um, DC and Maryland. They implemented also, um, again, they started with, out with a much more traditional community health worker program, then tra tra transitioned to a much more targeted, almost case management model, and they also, targeting high utilizers, and they actually also developed a community care coordination team, and so if there are gaps um, following intervention in the, in the traditional care coordination program, the, the patient is elevated to the community care coordination team. Um, and it's a team with EMS and social services and police and um, a lot of uh, local agencies and organizations, and they co-manage patients through bi-weekly um, case management meetings. They had an extensive health literacy campaign and a healthy lifestyle styles program called Part-Time Sister Circles. And they were looking to reduce preventable emissions, ED visits for chronic conditions. Um, they, generate, uh, they wanted to generate sustainable expansion of the primary and community health workforce in the HEZ, and they focused on diabetes and cardiovascular um, disease. And then our West Baltimore zone, um, again, focused on about 130 um, residents in four zip codes in West Baltimore. They expanded. There were a lot of providers in this area, but they weren't coordinated or integrated in any way. So that's really where the, H this, the West Baltimore HEZ focused. They were not looking to open new providers. They were looking to better integrate and coordinate services and care among the existing providers. And they as well um, implemented, a, by the end, a much more targeted care coordination community health worker program um, targeting high utilizers. Um, they have a tiered approach. Some folks go into, are followed for um, 30 days. Some folks, depending on need, are followed for 60 days. And this is with high utilizers div, um, identified through um, five partner hospitals. They provide residents with scholarship opportunities, uh, so folks who want to pursue uh, careers in health or, and social, or social services, they, and promote entry-level workforce opportunities for residents through internships. They address food deserts, cooking classes, offered fitness classes, chronic disease self-management courses, and offered mini-grants to community partners. And um, they were looking to reduce the ED visits related to cardiovascular disease and focused on diabetes, cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and smoking prevention. So over the course of the four-year initiative, which just technically sunsetted on June 30th of 2017, 21 healthcare delivery sites were opened or expanded across the five HEZs. 99 FT full-time equivalent positions were added or retained across the HEZs. We realized you know, pretty quickly that the hiring incentives wouldn't just be used for hiring, that there's such high turnover among practitioners in many of these communities that it would also be a significant incentive for retaining providers. Um, and that included 20 licensed independent practitioners, 32 other licensed or certified healthcare practitioners, and 12.75 community health workers. Over $300,000 in income tax credits were awarded to 34 practitioners through 64 awards, and of course that suggests that some practitioners did get multiple year awards and maybe it did help them uh, help retain them. 
and 19 practitioners were re uh, awarded loan repayment assistance to work in the zones. Um, over 340,000 visits were provided to 195,000 patients across the five HEZs through these HEZ um, healthcare delivery sites. And of course, care coordination programs targeting high utilizers were developed in all HEZs. Linked HEZ data systems, facility and data sharing, and co-management of complex patients were absolutely integral to the HEZ's uh, progress, but of course that took time. And then um, the self-management and community supports. You know, a lot of the HEZs will say that they really don't know if it's the added providers in these communities that's gonna make the difference. Thank you. That it's um, really the ability to address so many of their social um, needs and their other health needs that may make more of a difference. Um, we're still in the middle of our evaluation, which is being done here at um, the School of Public Health through the Center for Health Dis Disparity Solutions, Dr. Gaskin. So in the evaluation, of, of course, we're looking at those legislatively mandated outcomes. Um, and if, if you remember, I mentioned that when we were deciding the criteria for who was eligible to become an HEZ, we had mapped every zip code in the state. Um, as being HEZ eligible or not based on those health outcomes and poverty and um, poverty outcomes. So we now have, we have our, H, our 16 HEZ zip codes and we have HEZ eligible zip codes that are comparable um, in terms of income and health outcomes and our, our comparison zip codes. So we're looking at the HEZ, for the evaluation, we're looking at the HEZ zip codes versus the HEZ eligible zip codes. And we're looking at the HEZs at the time they were an HEZ, 2013 and beyond, compared to the time before they became an HEZ. And so this is how we're trying, which is 2009 through 2012. So this is how we're trying to tease out the effect, the impact of the HEZs, which you can imagine is hard because there's so much going on in these communities in terms of um, health efforts, especially in light of lots of changes, as I mentioned, in the healthcare system, many more insured folks, hospitals now partnering with communities and public health in a, in a way that they never have before. So you'll see here, this <laughs> does not necessarily um, suggest an impact um, this is looking at global hospital admissions in the HEZ awarded communities compared to the HEZ eligible communities. And the HEZ awarded communities did have lower median income. They had fewer residents employed. They had um, fewer married residents. There were a number of in, um, indicators that suggest that they were zip codes of higher need, even compared to the um, H other HEZ el eligible zip codes. So it's not surprising that we see in each of these graphs that the HEZ awarded rates are higher than the HEZ eligible rates. But here you'll see that while the HEZ, the inpatient stays for the HEZ awarded rates seem to be falling faster and are falling faster than the HEZ eligible zip codes, um, it doesn't appear that they're falling much faster post HEZ compared to before they're becoming an HEZ. So, for global H inpatient admissions, we're not so sure we've made an impact. But if you look at the HEZ target conditions, and those are chronic conditions, including diabetes, hypertension, congestive heart failure, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and mental health problems, and you look at um, ARCS prevention quality indicators, PQIs. These are standardized evidence-based metrics um, for conditions for which good outpatient care could potentially prevent the need for hospitalization or for which earlier intervention could prevent complications and more severe disease. Um, and those, it's a composite, those PQIs of both chronic and acute conditions. Because again, we were focused on um, chronic disease largely, but with because there were so many primary care medical homes opened that would also address acute needs, we're also tracking um, the acute conditions. So you'll see here that the HEZ-related zip codes are falling, um, I'm sorry, the HEZ-related conditions um, are falling faster in the HEZ-awarded um, zip codes um, than the HEZ-eligible zip codes and they're falling faster post 
HEZ compared to pre-HEZ. Um, and so that's the um, dotted blue line. Um, but you'll also see the PQI, the solid blue line, um, the, those, the prevention quality indicators are falling faster in the HEZ awarded zip codes relative to the eligible zip codes, but it just doesn't look like they're falling faster than they were before they became an HEZ. So this is probably our strongest evidence of um, impact. Readmissions per capita, um, readmissions within 30 days for this, um, uh, the same uh, condition um, have dropped significantly, but then increased across the state, everywhere except Anne Arundel HEZ, but even across the state in 2015. We're not quite sure, this is, data is um, newly provided to us, so we're not quite sure what to make of this. We're wondering if there's some statewide process at play. Maybe, for example, our health information exchange getting better um, at matching all of the patient's events under a common identifier, and so better tracking all of their utilization um, in 2015, which could make all rates work go up. We're not quite sure, so we'll be really curious to see the 2016 data. Emergency de um, department visit rates here, they went up um, in the HEZs and faster in the HEZs, global ED visits, um, which is consistent with a lot of data across the country post Affordable Care Act. Um, as folks g had new access to health insurance and care. Um, but here you'll see um, a bit of encouraging news, and then it looks like the ED visits for the HEZ-related NPQIs are falling faster in the HEZ-awarded zip codes compared to the HEZ-eligible zip codes from 2015 to 2016. So that's the blue dotted line and the solid blue line. Um, so if this continues um, in 2017, it could be evidence of an effect. So um, just very briefly, um, so I know I'm getting to the end of my time, I wanted to, there are so many challenges and lessons learned over the four-year initiative, and, but I wanted to speak directly to the, um, the framework pr proposed by Dr. Frieden. Um, you know, the, the technical package um, that I mentioned of HEZ, um, interventions that, you know, we, we did include, um, you know, addressing cult health literacy and cultural competency and linguistic competency and um, engaging local communities. So there, were, there was a package, but certainly um, the need for these very targeted care coordination programs and team-based care approaches, um, specifically mentioning the addressing of social determinants of health or including it in the package of technical interventions, including the use of population health tools. These are all things that we came to by the end of the initiative. Um, ha having more flexible incentives than hiring and income tax credits, you can imagine those are not the most flexible <laughs> incentives for hiring folks. Took a while for us to get those even stood up. Um, and integrated care models. So these were some of the additions to the technical package. Um, the need for a communication plan to attract patients and for sustainability. Um, again, we had a communication plan, but it was not um, as robust as it could have been. Um, and um, in terms of performance management, a planning year really would have been very helpful in terms of identifying metrics, data sources, and helping the HEZs develop the local data capacity um, before we started asking them to report. Because again, that timely access to data in order to refine implementation um, is really critical. And, and that's too where the innovation comes from, being able to um, really learn from your operations as you're implementing and um, able to switch gears and innovate and re-strategize. So, and of course, because we're at Hopkins, I just thought I'd present some research questions that, um, you know, we, that we will be able to answer some of in our, um, through our evaluation, but not all. Looking at the HEZ effective effectiveness in different contexts, understanding neighborhoods, hospital-based versus health department-based HEZs, rural versus urban and suburban settings, 
more versus less mature coalitions because of course we had a range um, with amongst our five hospital based versus community based care coordination programs even there's a, a really steep learning curve right now again as do, um, this, this shift from volume to value um, and payment reform efforts associated with the Affordable Care Act but then also global budgets, which a num number of other states are now going to. It's really um, a steep learning curve to learn how to effectively manage these very complex patient populations. Um, so especially for healthcare systems. So, and we were part of that, you know, really documenting um, where, with what patients we might succeed in intervening and for how long do you hold on to them and um, at what level of intervention, and th these are things that are all still kind of being figured out. The role of policies and the policy environment and public health outcomes, effectiveness of the tax credit and loan repayment incentives, um, the role of trust and social capital, which was huge. Um, our West Baltimore HEZ in particular, at the time, th over the course of our initiative, experienced um, the riots, the uprising, and um, you know had a lot of just physical damage in the zone and really had to shift gears for a significant period of time and already faced tremendous barriers. Even at an institution with, at Bon Secours, which has been there doing on the ground community work for decades. So um, there's just such um, deep distrust of institutions, no matter who they are. Um, so the cost effectiveness of HEZs and for whom, you know, there's a lot of these new payment models are really based on shared savings and then if you're keeping folks out of the hospital, then being able to access those savings to reinvest. But we, it's one of our biggest frustrations. We can't find the savings. You know, you, we see all this reduced utilization in our HEZs in particular, and we go to the hospitals, and we go to this, you know, Medicaid, and we go to our population health folks, and we're like, all right, now we need to capture some of those savings to sustain the HEZs, and literally to a T, everyone says, we don't have them. I ask someone, you know, like, we can, we've had, a full year of sustainability planning funded by the Robert Johnson Foundation and meeting after meeting trying to identify where the savings are and we can't find them. So that's another good research question uh, if anyone's interested. Um, cost of, oh, and then the most effective role for government. Um, so anyway, thank you so much for your time and um, I'm very happy to take any questions. Thanks. Um, it sounds like the HEZs are doing a lot of on-the-ground social work, like connecting with transportation and um, incentives and job trainings and or job incentives. Is there any room for um, adding in like political advocacy as a function of HEZs to help support some of those ends? Thank you. That's a very good question. I know when I came to the HEZs, I. Um, I had come from working on, well, I had come from here, but prior to that, I had worked on another place-based initiative out in LA County, and it was foundation, it was based at a nonprofit hospital and funded by foundations, and the, the policy advocacy piece was huge. It was an asthma management um, program, and so we did lots of community organizing to reduce exposures at the ports of Long Beach in LA, and all of the rail coming out of there, and we um, petitioned um, city Council around housing quality and um, code enforcement and so forth, but that was not a core component of the HEZs. Um, and not that it was left out entirely. So the way it was developed, and part of that is um, because it's situated, it was funded and supported by government, and government can't do um, policy and advocacy work in the same way at all. So that is where partnerships um, come into play. But it also, you know, so we, and we didn't engage um, across sectors at the agency level. Um, it was, but it was built into the design um, of the initiative to happen at the local level. So it really, so it was a, it was a health disparities work group of the Maryland Health Quality and Cost Council, which was um, composed of a number of experts in health, chaired by Dean Reese at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and a number of your um, Hopkins folks sat on it. And they looked at 
addressing a lot of those issues being a very local exercise and so empowering the HEZs to tackle that through the design, their coalitions and the design of their interventions. And so a lot of that happened through the care coordination programs. And so then there were systems changes that came out of getting to know patients and systems barriers through the care coordination programs. Um, and so that's really more where it occurred. And so yes, I, it, I, it is a limitation for sure and partly a function of it being a, a state supported initiative. It is a big part of those foundation um, funded um, place based initiatives, again, like the Harlem Children's Zone and the, um, a lot of the work that the California Endowment is doing. So, but it, it did happen, it was just at a much more local level. And I just had a question about uh, the degree of coordination between the different sites. I mean, obviously there were, you know, some that were rural and some urban, suburban, but um, I was curious. I mean, they seem to have come to some similar conclusions. Like you said, everybody uh, ended up with the care coordination programs. And I was curious how much interaction there was between the, the different sites um, as they were running their HEZ. Yes, thank you. That's a good question. And that as well evolved over time. That happened less at the beginning when they were so focused on just stand, recruiting, hiring, standing up um, healthcare delivery sites, expanding them, renovating buildings because there weren't buildings fit to, you know, ready to be inhabited in a lot of these communities. Um, but when Michelle took over and the, the um, direction in 2014, that's when there was a significant change. Um, both Michelle and I came on the pro program in 2014 in um, how we worked with the sites. And so we worked, um, we brought them together for quarterly meetings to provide technical assistance um, and have them share ideas and strategies and have presentations from our health information, our statewide health information exchange or um, the HSCRC, which is the Hospital Rate Setting Commission, which uh, was where a lot of our hospital data is housed. So, and that's where we would, um, in, I was responsible for the performance management and they provided quarterly reports to me. So I would, I had lots of just constant back and forth with them. And then um, we, I would notice common challenges across the zones and then that, those would become topics for our quarterly meetings. And we had a summit um, in years one and year four uh, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, the first to focus on developing their, further refining their strategic plans and the, the fourth year to focus on um, sustainability. So in the end, again, over time, it, there was a lot of interaction. And right now we just um, are working on our first uh, publication together about the HEZ um, experience. So we're doing a, a, a writing um, collaborative effort across the five HEZs. So. Thanks, great, I think this is fascinating somehow, maybe because I'm not in the social sciences field, but I hadn't heard of it. Um, are there any plans for expanding, for, for adding HECs, uh, or, or not yet, or waiting until you have more data? Thank you, very good question. So at the beginning, it was really contingent, but there, were, there was only funding for the five. Um, certainly, we were holding on to the, the other 14 or um, or 15, no, 14 applicants from across the state um, in hopes that more funding would become available and that we could do a new round um, of awards. But that didn't come to pass. And um, so we really have been working, um, all five HEZs still exist, um, largely intact. Um, it, it, you know, in terms of the intervention, they've had to let go of a few interventions, but largely they look very much the same as when they were officially a state funded HEZ. So the three hospitals have absorbed a lot of the efforts in their HEZs again to help meet their global budgets. And um, so we, and we've started a, um, we're starting an HEZ learning collaborative and we've had talks with RWJ and Kellogg and ASTO. So we've had lots of, um, Talks. There's a lot of interest. We've had interest from a number of other states. There are now um, Rhode Island health equity zones, which are very similar, and Philadelphia health enterprise zones, and um, Delaware and North Carolina also contacted us. So there's a lot of 
interest, which is part of why we're starting the Learning Collaborative and making sure we get our publications out. But um, there's also some interests from funders. Um, there was also a Big Ten initiative. So anyway, there's a lot of potential, nothing concrete yet. So, yes? Um, I wanted to know, um, concerning the increased um, ED usage in the HEZ zones, mm -hmm. if you're looking to see um, what portion led to admissions versus those that were discharged directly from the emergency room? Any that's a good know? question. And that's one, um, no, we have not looked at that. Um, and that would be interesting to look at. Um, is one, I could see it as potentially um, being resolved by extending the hours of the PCMHs or maybe mm -hmm. opening an urgent care center. Yeah, so you're right. No, that's a really good, hours. right, looking more closely at the access issues. No, you're right. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. You know that somehow there are savings, but you can't, nobody can find those savings. So I think eventually if there is state money involved and there is no benefit or economic benefit, um, it may be the deter you know, more funding to come in because it's like you're offering savings, but the savings are not coming. So um, is there like any like more, um, objective plans to really find those savings and really use them towards the community or extend hours or things? You know, yes, well, lines? thank Yeah, so the business case, right. We are the Hopkins, um, part of their analysis and their final report will be due out by the end of the year. So um, our about final HEZ evaluation report. And they are doing the cost analysis associated with those reductions, um, which Initial findings suggest they are substantial, despite the increase in ED visits, and dis and and that's still accounting for the 16 million that the, that the state provided over the four years. So, um, again, that's not final yet, but again, the, the um, so yes, that is a, a very important piece. Um, that if we could show, um, even if we can't identify where the, the savings sit, that but that there are savings, um, especially when managing these very complex populations, then it becomes a much more marketable model. Um, so hopefully that is a big part of the, the case we hope to make, so. So thank you, Dr. Dwyer. I think um, just in terms of timing, um, I'll be the last question, if that's okay. Um, so a question and a comment. So I wanted to know how willing um, were hospital-based zones um, to embrace care coordination, um, given that it didn't start out as an initiative where care coordination was the, the initial um, consideration. So that's one. And then my second um, question to you is more in line with the innovative ways in which these zones implemented the initiative. So if you can talk a little bit perhaps about transportation in St. Mary's County, for example, and where did they find a trans transportation routes? Or mm -hmm. you mentioned volunteers at, at Morris Blum. Mm -hmm. How did these come about? To be innovative in terms of implementing this program that didn't really have that full structure to begin with. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so the hospitals actually kind of took the lead on these care coordination programs. Again, it's so funny because when I think back to that asthma program I managed, place-based program in LA County years ago, we used to, we would go to hospitals and say, we have five full-time community health workers who are trained to go in work with these families, help them understand the very complicated asthma medications, look at triggers, asthma triggers in the home, help them remedy triggers, et cetera, et cetera. And the hospitals would say, oh, we, can't, we don't have time. We are so busy. We couldn't possibly change our discharge procedures to include a referral to your asthma community health workers. That's impossible. Now, because there were no incentives in the system for them to do that. It, it, it was more incentive, actually, for the kids to keep coming back over and over and over with their uncontrolled asthma. That's how they got paid. And I'm not saying these are evil people who wanted kids to be sick with asthma, but the system incentivized high utilization. And so this turns that all on their head, on the, its head, the global budgets. So now hospitals literally were like, they couldn't find their community partners, their community health workers, 
and their public health partners fast enough. They were like, wait a minute, we have to keep these patients out of the hospital. We cannot have them keep coming back uncontrolled. Um, and so they really, and again, and then there's a lot of debate at, on hospital-based care coordination system versus community-based care coordination system, um, programs and the value added of each. But I, they really kind of took the lead. The local health departments took a broader approach, more comprehensive approach to their care coordination programs. But the, the, the hospital-based HEZs, I think, really took the lead, again, based on global budgets. Um, and in terms of, yeah, the innovation really was um, everything from the, there was a, just a lot of innovation around the data systems. I mean, prior to um, our statewide health information exchange um, and prior to the HEZs, which provided a lot of funding um, that they could use to address gaps in, in data capacity. You know, we, when we first started, there were still a lot of paper-based systems. And so when we were asking them to report certain, certain metrics or to track patients as they utilize care throughout their HEZ, they, they couldn't, because they couldn't link systems to know if the same patient went to one provider and another provider in the, same, in the HEZ. So by the end of the initiative, to have um, integrated data systems that could track utilization, at least within the HEZ. These were web-based patient tracker systems. Um, but then also often, like for example, in, in the Prince George's County Zone where they developed their own county level HEZ, a, a lot with HEZ um, funding. They could track utilization all across the county, into DC, across Maryland, and into Delaware. So that, um, and, and providers get real-time feeds, you know, about their patient's utilization. And they, they've gone to the ED, they'll get a feed at the end of the day that their patient ended up in the ED, what the diagnosis was, um, if they've been discharged, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then in, a, a lot around building trust and patient engagement. Um, and like um, Michelle said, the, um, there were certain, uh, I mean, you know, I think Morris Blum, you know, and it's kind of counterintuitive. You would think they build a clinic in this residency, what could go wrong? I mean, it just seems like patients would just, just it's right in their home. But there were some really interesting dynamics um, between, you know, the, the residents of this building were largely African American and the residents of the surrounding zip code um, were largely um, Hispanic. So. And this clinic was in their home. And so all of a sudden they have this whole, they have people coming from outside, just coming into their home, you know, um, folks they don't know, they've never had any chance to encounter or get to know. And so there were, there were just, and again, and also they didn't know the Anne Arundel Medical Center staff in any way, and the staff had not engaged them in the setup of the clinic. So I think the residents were really just kind of put off at first, like who are all these people coming into our home, now sitting in the first floor? So, but over time, of course, and again, um, through a lot of efforts to really engage them and involve them in running the clinic, um, and making decisions about the clinic, it um, really changed the patient's perspective. And then in the end, yeah, we, Mr. P and, and many other patients were regularly involved in, in, in running the clinic. And then um, Greater Lexington Park, yeah, their transportation program just took off. And that is something that the hospital will now pay for. And they got donated vehicles from the county and from local police. And, you know, in the end, it wasn't again once folks learned about the need and the response and that um, then the resources just came so um, there really were a lot of very innovative um, solutions because they had all of the folks at the table that's largely and took the time to build um, strategic plans and approaches together and to really engage meaningfully with the folks at the table and with their target communities so Thank you.